A woman should be deathly afraid of rejecting a guy. When a guy asks her out, she should be made aware of what horrible fate will be left on the guy if she rejects him, and the only way to accomplish this is through instilling fear on the females. Whenever a guy gets rejected, he should scare the female, go on a shocking rant right in front of her, and make it seem as if he has lost his sanity and is ready to kill the female. If enough guys do this, then rejections will be completely completely destroyed. Second step is the actual date. If the female thinks she can just ghost the guy and not go on the date, then she must be proven wrong. These females should be doxxed and stalked. Threatening phone calls should be made to her house and the guy should leave threatening objects at her door, such as a knife covered in animal blood. This post was taken from incels.me, a forum that used to be available for incels to gather before the site took the forum down. Other forums on Reddit, for example, where gathering for this kind of stuff is the norm, have also been banned for their association with inciting violence, as well as frequent links with mass killing and gendered violence. However, as internet culture likes to make a joke out of everything, the word incels and the people that are considered incels have since been reduced to that of a meme by people online. And with this, the threat of the community has actually been belittled because of people constantly memeing this issue. A lot of people taking the mick out of this kind of stuff are probably aiming to deter anybody from actually thinking that incel is based on any logical merit. But by making the subject a joke, sadly, the seriousness and the threat of the community can actually be overlooked. This video is going to look at the rise of incel culture, the origin, the characteristics, the issues, and some of the proposed strategies for combating the more radicalised nature of this ideology. Because of the nature of this video, I am going to issue a trigger warning because some of the content in this video is sensitive and might be distressing to some viewers. Some of the topics that might be discussed in detail or simply referenced to are sexual assault, rape, violence, misogyny and derogatory language. I will try to lighten the mood with some jokes and cutaways so that the video is easier to watch. However, because of the seriousness of the topic that I'm addressing, I don't want to overdo that. Be warned, this is a serious long ass video. The word manosphere first appeared in 2009 on blog post to describe the online network of men's interest communities. The term was later popularised by Ian Ironwood, author of the self-published The Manosphere, a new hope for masculinity. Being home for various types of communities, from men's rights organisations to pickup artists, the sphere has received considerable media attention, most notably for its extreme misogyny and association with high profile offline events. From the Isla Vista and Oregon mass shootings and cases of college campus rape to the sustained abuse and death threats directed at female gamers and journalists that culminated in Gamergate. However, the origin of this sphere looked very different to how it looks now. In the early 1970s, college-aged men began engaging in the emerging women's liberation movements. Instead of seeing feminism as problematic and whiny, men scholars like Warren Farrell, Mark Fastu and Jack Nichols acknowledged that sexism harmed women, but emphasised that strict gender roles and patriarchal society were equally harmful harmful to men. And so came the development of the men's rights movement. For example, early men liberation literature discussed emotional stoicism, unequal child support obligations, male-only draft requirements, and the social pressure of male masculinity. In fact, far from being against feminism, early MRM's central goal was actually to, quote, attract men to feminism by constructing a discourse that stressed how the male role was impoverished, unhealthy, and even lethal for men. 
But how did this positive contribution to gender politics spiral into a breeding group for misogyny, sexism, and even violence? Well, some men didn't think feminism was the answer. In fact, some men blamed feminism for their struggles. The failings of American culture, which is what they blamed for the male crisis that they found themselves in, was blamed on feminism and more broadly liberalism, instead of seeing feminism as a way out of that crisis. According to Debbie Ging, the Manosphere has five distinct groups. Men's rights activists, who believe that men are systematically disadvantaged in society. Men going their own way, who abstain from relationships with women. Pickup artists, who seek to have sex with as many women as possible. Traditional Christian conservatives and gamers slash geeks. Ging also separately considers incels, who are unable to find a romantic or sexual partner despite desiring one. What links them together under the Manosphere umbrella term is their sharing of the central belief that feminine values actually dominate society, and that this fact is suppressed by feminists and political correctness, and that men must fight back against the overreaching misandrist culture to protect their very existence. They see female equality as detrimental to male rights. As after all, men not being above women is discrimination and and women need to be put in their place. Perhaps no more on the wider internet for its existence in meme culture, the red pill theory is central to the politics of the Manosphere. This is an analogy derived from the 1999 film, The Matrix, where the protagonist, Neo, is given the choice between taking a red or blue pill. The blue pill means switching off and living a life in delusion, whereas taking the red pill means becoming enlightened to life's ugly truths. The red pill philosophy adopted by the Manosphere interprets this as an awakening of men to feminism's misandry and brainwashing. As one Redditor actually put it, Bringing red pill to the masses isn't going to fix society because every man can't be the alpha, and just like feminists can't force men to be attracted to tattooed ham beasts with rainbow hair, TRP can't force women to be attracted to omegas and beta orbiters. TRP is about dealing with what is, not what we wish it was. Though from a certain perspective you can kind of understand why this is drawn from the metaphor provided by the Wachowski sisters, it is arguably far from the point the sisters were either intentionally or subconsciously inferring to. That perspective being if you, you know, close one eye and turn your head to the left and squint a little bit, can't see it, well, you must be a normie. In a long Twitter thread for Netflix film, the streaming service actually broke down The Matrix as a trans narrative. Netflix broke down many of the allegorical references, including Neo's character taking on a new name and subsequently renouncing his dead name. It also speaks about the red pill slash blue pill dichotomy serving as a metaphor for estrogen hormone therapy, which two points out was literally a red pill in the 1990s. Coincidentally, Lily Wachowski came out as trans in 2014, with her sister first making a public appearance as a trans woman four years prior. However, as shown by the philosophy that is rampant in the Manosphere, despite the narrative of the film being loaded with trans subtext, the red pill has taken on a vastly different meaning online. The term was originally used to describe people who were aware of the unpleasant truths of the world. But the truth that men's rights activists have supposedly been awakened to is that the world is dominated by women where men can't express their issues without fear of retribution. And of course, men's silence and oppression is a real thing, and it is heartbreaking that men feel like they can't express their emotions or problems. However, the overarching blame on women and feminism is not the cause, but rather expectations of toxic masculinity masculinity and gender roles perpetuated by the social hierarchy, which both men and women suffer for, and both men and women upheld. The red pill has also been taken on by alt-right groups, as well as conspiracy theorists and white supremacists. 
Bingo. So now we have the background knowledge of the manosphere, how do incels come into this? While incels are not an isolated phenomenon, they are considered particularly dangerous as they are associated with many mass killings in Canada and the United States. In fact, the recent Plymouth shootings in the UK have also been linked to incel culture with articles addressing how the shooter had links to these online communities. In the wake of the Oregon shootings of 2015, the Federal Bureau of Investigation began an investigation into comments posted on the R9K channel of the social media site 4chan, notorious for its libertarian invocation of free speech to excuse misogyny, racism, and niche pornography. I bet Bao Delphine is popular on that site. Those contributing on these boards appear to be organising a social media campaign of revenge against women and social justice warriors and the alpha males who deprived them of sexual success. These members call themselves beta homophobic slur and incels, applauding Isla Vista killer Elliot Roger. The term incel was originally coined by a woman who wanted to foster a community of lonely people. The the term refers to involuntary celibate, indicating that incels are deprived of sex. This name has been taken on with pride by incel members because it victimises them. It suggests that they are not at fault and they don't have sex because they have no choice in the matter, hence the term involuntary. Incel has since been appropriated by a community of heterosexual men who blame other men and, more seriously, women for their lack of sexual activity. They regard themselves as having no possibility of finding a partner to get validation, love or acceptance from due to unattractiveness, insecurities or mental illness. From this impression, some sympathy can be derived for these men. They clearly feel isolated and although the focus on the importance of sex is a bit strange to me, these definitions imply that these men are just lonely and sad and they can't find anyone to love them. In the wider manosphere, groups superficially engage with evolutionary psychology and genetic determinism to support their negative view on women. They recycle theories that support claims that women are manipulative, exploitive, irrational, hardware to pair with alpha males, and need to be dominated. They also complain over women's sexual and economic liberation and express nostalgia for an idealised past where men were guaranteed sex via marriage. Though this misogyny is an overarching theme in the entirety of the manosphere, it seems quite predominant in the incel subculture. Whereas MRAs will focus on rights and pick up artists, discuss and learn tactics to attract women, incels often just express hatred for men and women. Though they acknowledge that their own unattractiveness and qualities limit their access to sex, they also blame women for failing to provide them with opportunities for sex. Rather than concerning themselves with so-called delusional self-improvement to achieve their aims, incels rail against rather than aspire to be alpha males, who they refer to as chads and normies. Instead, they embrace the self-deprecating identity of being an incel. Cell. Even if one could view their position as unfortunate and really lonely, their extreme expressions of misogyny, racism and frequent engagement in hacking and doxing make it difficult to sympathise with the group, which perhaps increases their sense of alienization and forces them into more of the radical sectors. So how do these incel groups go about establishing their position in this seemingly female-dominated society? Surely there must be a more convincing mantra to draw in lonely young men? I mean, just assuming that they're not all stupid, because that would be a tad bit sexist. Within the incel community, there is a strict social hierarchy, which is based on appearance, wealth, and ability to attract a sexual partner. Incels place themselves at the bottom of this hierarchy, which also includes Chads, Stacys, and Beckys. Chads are seen as the diametric opposite of incels, being men who are high status, rich, muscular, and have sex with as many women as 
they want. They are basically the embodiment of alpha males whom Stacy's, the attractive women in this social hierarchy, only have sex with. Becky's are also in this social hierarchy and they are regarded as attractive women but not as attractive as Stacy, who are also not interested in sleeping with incels. To establish the social system and theory that the hierarchy rests upon, incels use the idea of sex as capital, in which there is a sex deficit that affects mostly men, especially incels. You hear it here folks, sex is now a currency. They then use these figures of Chad's and Stacy's and Becky's, as well as the victimization of themselves, of course, at the bottom of the hierarchy, to explain how the social structure works. Viewing the display of a partner as a symbolic form of wealth, incels equate erotic capital to socially ascribed status. They reject the idea that they themselves hold any erotic capital, demonstrating how they place themselves at the bottom of society and also perceive other to place them at the bottom of society on the basis of being unable to have and display a romantic partner. Hakeem describes erotic capital as a combination of aesthetic, visual, physical, social and sexual attractiveness to other members of your society, especially to members of the opposite sex in all social contexts. Though Hakeem argues that erotic capital should be used to achieve equity, sadly, the existence of it and understanding that women have more erotic capital than men is expressed in a misogynistic light. The idea that women withhold sex from men, which incels believe is a given right, is verified by the fact that women have more erotic capital. Moreover, it must be women who are failing to provide opportunities for sex because they have an excess capital, so women are regarded as the problem here. In particular, they blame feminism for disrupting what they perceive as the natural order whereby women and broader societal structures would be organised around heterosexual and monogamous couplings. Furthermore, their hate towards women for not allowing them sexual access can be conceptualised as a widely held, in-group, misogynistic femphobia, whereby incels assert a universal failings by women to comply with the conditions of heteropatriarchal, femininity. That was a mouthful. You want to be pretty and have rights? Since when did women get to have their cake and eat it? Actually, maybe they shouldn't be eating cake because then they would not be able to attract a romantic partner as being not stick thin makes you part of the bottom 20% of women, according to these men. Seeing sociosexual capital as the ultimate marker of status, they see themselves as owed access to women, owed a degree of sociosexual capital, and do not acknowledge an element of exchange present in the sexual marketplace that they envision. The repeated assumption is that women have prejudged them as unworthy, and that they have either matched or succeeded the efforts made by other men, and are therefore destined to fail. But if you've never spoken to a woman and you've spent the last 13 years of your life socialising through Discord, I don't understand how you've made any effort. Roger and members of the online community continually stress that a girlfriend or sexual access to one is something to be displayed. Roger, on writing of his hope of winning the lottery, commented that once I'd won it, I'd be able to have my beautiful blonde girlfriend. I'd be able to show the world that girls consider me worthy. I'd be able to show the world how superior I am. He writes that displaying a beautiful girlfriend was his ultimate purpose in life. His reason for living. Seems like you're putting a bit too much pressure on women here. You know, giving them a little bit too much worth for your misogynistic likes. The inability to gain sexual access is how incels define group membership, frequently expressing frustration about the perceived challenges they experience in obtaining a romantic partner. However, incels predominantly blame women for this, arguing that they fail to comply with the conditions of patriarchal femininity. As argued by Hoskin, to be feminine is to be a passive recipient of male pleasure. 
In blaming women for incels lack of sex, they also suggest that women deny them sex because they have unrealistic physical standards and collectively all desire the most attractive males, hence leaving incel behind in the marketplace. This is captured by what incels call the 80-20 rule, as explained on r slash brain cells. 80% of the effects come from 20% of the causes. What is the effect we're referring to? Sex. What causes sex? Those who take the active role in the mating process, men. So the 80-20 rule, as applied to the SMP, sexual marketplace, actually means 20% of the men get 80% of the sex. The difference is subtle, but important. The top 20% of men get the lion's share of what women offer as affection, while the bottom 80% get what's left over after hookup culture has taken its toll. Lol. They refer to the uneven distribution by using the Pareto principle. By suggesting that this is unfair or inequitable, incels imply that women should be a stable resource in the sexual marketplace, as if women are objects to be consumed and not people with rights. Incels also assume that men exclusively initiate sex, but that women elect to only sleep with the top 20% of men who initiate it. The universal sexual strategy is for males to approach, continually, as many females as he can until he finally succeeds with one. Unless you are a very attractive male, you will never be approached, nor will you succeed with many of the females you eagerly talk to. Hence the statistical getting lucky element of the whole mating game. Under the 80-20 rule, the top 20% of men are constructed as alpha males, otherwise known as chads, and the women who compete over chad will either be predominantly successful or occasionally unsuccessful. Under this new gender hegemony, Incel's view that femininity is a means of competing against other women for sexual access to Chad, because of course, like them, everything revolves around sex and relationships in this world. I don't have any hobbies, I haven't got any interests, I don't have any talents, there's nothing I like to do for fun except attract Chads. Placing themselves at the bottom of the social structure, most incels believe that they lack any form of power or influence within this new gendered supremacy, which is why they believe the only way to challenge these conditions is through a unified socio-political movement, or mass killings, or organised mass suicides. Yes, these guys actually think that by killing themselves or enough people, society will go, oh, maybe we should listen to them. Maybe we should listen to the guy with the shotgun. Maybe he should decide how society is run. Arguing for a shift to a more outdated system of governments, incels believe that placing men as a primary decision maker over the sexual marketplace, where women will have no say in deciding on or agreeing to sexual partnerships, will actually fix the sex deficit. And you wonder why a society where women have no rights or say in their sexual relationships butts heads with feminist rhetoric. Under the belief that the top 20% of men have access to the top 80% of women, incels argue that the bottom 80% of men, which they put themselves at the bottom of, have to compete for the remaining 20% of women. Posters frequently regard this remaining 20% as the ugliest percentage of women, however because because of the deficit, they implied that these women still have access to men, even men they would regard as out of that woman's league. In this system, women are gatekeepers of sex, whilst incels are their victims. The sense of entitlement to and understanding of women's bodies as objects also appears in the way in which the word force is used. In a study, two female academics found that whilst many users don't actually explicitly encourage forcing women to have sex or be in relationships with them. The discussion of force suggests that this is indeed a possibility for incels. In fact, not forcing women into these things is often linked to their inability to do so, rather than their unwillingness to do so. Women are once again positioned as the gatekeepers of sex and consequently of incels happiness. Incels in contrast are the victims, constantly starved for sex and fighting other men to gain access to women's bodies that are scarcely available. And better yet, they're not even the bodies that these incels want. By making themselves the victim, forcing women stops being a matter of women's rights to a matter of 
incels' rights. To address this injustice, incels suggest solutions that, whilst exploitive for women, they consider fair for themselves, such as the legalisation of prostitution, or limiting women's sexual freedom, and banning abortion. Lack of access to women's bodies is perceived by incels as a denial of a basic right, something that chads can effortlessly obtain, because women always give men sex, it is only incels that they reject. Stressing the fact that they don't hate all women, just some of them, the women they hate the most are those who refuse to accept their worldview. Women who say no. The abusive language that is found on these forums tend not to target women in general, but specifically target feminists due to their promiscuity. However, it is not women's promiscuity that incels despise the most, considering they actually advocate for things like the legalisation of prostitution. What incels really hate and what they blame feminists for are women who refuse them. Women who will sleep with several other men, but say no to incels. Stacey is described universally across incel communities as having the most erotic capital. Stacey is reduced to and mocked for her feminine presentation, because it doesn't fit with the incel imaginary of hegemonic masculinity. By not conforming to incels' expectations of a right to sexual access, women are belittled, hypersexualized, and vilified. Stacey does not contribute meaningfully to a labour force because she, and women more generally, are supposedly unable to match a man's skill. Stacy's get paid for existing. Stacy has a $2,000 Gucci bag while still never working a day in her life. She lives in luxury. He. <laughs> When men in incel communities discuss any success with women, the overarching assumption by the community is that they're being used for money. Becky doesn't have the same universal agreed perception that Stacy does, but she is regarded as another slightly less attractive woman who still isn't interested in sleeping with incels. Her presentation is not always hyper-feminized. She might intentionally present outside of patriarchal femininity by dyeing her hair green, pink, or blue after attending college, choosing more androgynous, loose, baggy clothing to hide her body, or being dominant in her relationships. Incels devalue Becky through Stacy and devalue her feminine presentation because they see it as less worthy of attention given its deviation from patriarchal norms. Incels think Becky is promiscuous to protest patriarchal gender roles, something that incels often downplay or insult using slut shaming rhetoric. Think of raunch feminism, for example, and slut walks. Yep, those are Becky's. And finally, Chad is often understood as the male counterpart to Stacy, or a prototypical alpha male. While Chad is understood as desirable, incels don't acknowledge his erotic capital and will instead describe him in ways that cut down his desirability, positioning him as mentally inferior to them. While incels acknowledge that women are attracted to Chad, their attraction is understood as an evolutionary flaw that women collectively hold, a flaw that Roger and others online argue is animalistic, degenerate, and representative of underdeveloped thought. Females truly have something mentally wrong with them. Their minds are flawed, and at this point in my life, I was beginning to see it. All of the hot, beautiful girls walked around with obnoxious, tough, jock-type men who partied all the time and acted crazy. They should be going for intelligent gentlemen, such as myself. Women are sexually attracted to the wrong type of man. This is a major flaw in the very foundation of humanity. Even though incels devalue Chad, it is women who are blamed for continuing to pursue him. The contradiction between both being exploited and exploiting exemplifies their misogyny and the strength of it. Women are objects to be used by Chad, but they also deny Chad and all men reciprocal affection. In this way, women are held accountable both for the existence of Chad and of incels for universally denying love and affection whilst controlling and affording sexual access to the attractive elite. Chad might get pussy, but in the end, he just loses money and any feelings he has for Stacy are likely not reciprocated. So now we have had a long-winded 
basic and general understanding of who incels are, other than their rampant misogyny and belief that they are owed access to women, what is the problem with their culture? And what has led to the negative reception from the media and banning of forums in which they gather? The r slash incels subreddit had around 40,000 members when it was taken down in October 2017. This was because Reddit introduced a new policy to ban content that encourages, glorifies, incites or calls for violence or harm against an individual or a group of people. Subsequently, some of the activity that led to the subreddit being taken down included advice on how to get away with but no, they're just lonely men who don't have sex <laughs> that discuss how to get away with rape. I see absolutely nothing wrong with this. A popular topic on r slash incels was what women want slash desire. However, this isn't actually concerned with what women actually definitely want, but what these incels assume that they want. Because women's voices are kept out of the conversation. When women do contribute, their comments are often silenced through disbelief, verbal abuse, and or frequent requests to leave the forum. Before women swarm me crying or argument, you're wrong, big dicks hurt me, sex with them is painful, I like smaller ones and I'm happy with my partner. No, please, shut up and stop writing to me. Due to the public and therefore visible nature of the forum, these posts can also serve as a gatekeeping practice for anybody intending to challenge the incel ideology. A study found that frequent attributes for women on r slash incels were whores, people and sluts. The study argues that the derogatory nature of this language presents r slash incels as a site of constant reproduction of ways to linguistically degrade and objectify women. Incels also dehumanise women as referring to them as objects, female humanoid organisms or femoids or animals, as shown as metaphors such as Women are f***ing animals. Women are shallow creatures. Women are toxic wild beasts. Citroen and Norton framed online abuse as a restriction of women's civil engagement and abuse of their digital censorship. Lewis highlighted further similarities between offline violence and online violence against women, such as the fact that both have the effect of instilling fear into women, silencing them, especially through the threat of sexualized violence, but also through exclusion, disdain, or discrediting. This policing of women's behaviour functions as a reminder of who is in control and who dictates the boundaries within which women are free to move. Like offline violence, online abuse also happens on a scale. But this spectrum doesn't just range from unpleasant, sporadic, non-threatening, direct or indirect messages to frequent, highly threatening, hateful content. It also involves misogynistic discourse and practices considered non-criminal or non-threatening because they are seen as fiction or satire cultural in-jokes, or because they don't actually entail a direct interaction between users and therefore can actually be defended under the free speech argument. Because this behaviour, which is frequent in these forums, is seen as non-threatening, the more threatening behaviour can be regarded as exceptional behaviour that is not reflective of the majority of the group and therefore isn't actually an issue with the culture. And more so the dichotomy between the mundane forms of misogyny to the exceptional misogyny makes the mundane forms seem more insignificant in comparison, therefore protecting it from scrutiny. Basically, all misogyny bad, not just the misogyny that threatens women's lives. An Amnesty International poll from 2017 reports that over three quarters of women who said that they had experienced abuse or harassment on a social media platform made changes to the way they used the platforms. This includes restricting what they post about. 32% of women said that they had stopped posting content that expressed their opinions on certain issues. Across all countries, 61% of those who had said that they experienced online abuse said that they had experienced lower self-esteem or loss of confidence as a result. More than half said that they experienced stress, 
anxiety or panic attacks after experiencing online abuse or harassment. And 63% said online abuse or harassment had meant they were unable to concentrate for long periods of time. Around a quarter of those who had experienced abuse said that it made them fear for their family's safety. This online hate therefore forces women out of online spaces or hinders the extent that they can take part in said space. Women shouldn't have to just deal with this, especially to the extent that they do. It makes them feel like the online space is one in which they aren't welcome. As the internet is a public space, this is a clear example of exclusion, discrimination, discrimination and inequality. If we saw the internet as a country, for example, imagine how we would feel if women couldn't express their opinions without being degraded, if women couldn't be online without being attacked with sexualized abuse. We would think it horrible. In fact, we readily protest that behavior, but it's okay online. But you don't have to include women in everything. If you want a space just for friends or just for men, you can make a private space online, which is 100% doable. But making a public space only accessible to men hinders on women's digital rights as an internet user. But if the threat of online abuse isn't bad enough, which it usually isn't considered to be, the manosphere may even radicalize men into committing acts of anti-women violence. On the 23rd of April 2018, Alec Manassian posted an announcement on Facebook. Private Manassian Infantry 10, wishing to speak to Sergeant 4chan please, C2324-9161. The incel rebellion has already begun. We will overthrow all the Chads and Stacys. All hail Supreme Gentleman Elliot Roger. Manassian then drove a van through Toronto, killing 10 people and injuring 16. Munasan also included a dedication to the cause of the Incel Rebellion, identified their enemy, Chads and Stacys, and referred to their martyr, Elliot Roger. Incel has since been a contributing factor to over 90 fatalities and injuries since Roger's attack. In using violence to make a political statement, particularly against civilians, insult attacks can be seen as clear examples of violent extremism. But are they considered that? Not really. Since the late 2000s, the global strategy against terrorism has been extended and refined to include violent extremism, the use or support of violence to achieve ideological, religious or political goals. Incel violence, however, is readily underplayed and doesn't seem to come under a form of terrorism. Because incels use violence to pursue ideological and political goals, it just makes sense that incels' violent wing should fall under the ideological violence genre of violent extremism. And researchers have found that incel-affiliated men are more likely than others to support violence. In Canada, experts interviewed by the Fifth Estate found that 120 incidents of extremist violence over the past 30 years have been committed by alt-right extremists. Yet again, they are not regarded as the same level of threat as other extremist groups, despite the staggering amount of extremist violence associated with alt-right extremism. But alt-right and incel aren't interchangeable terms, but like other forms of radicalization, 4chan, Reddit and other discussion boards provide the space for incels to gather, share material and radicalize. The Fifth Estate found that at least 60,000 people were active in the three main public incel forums online. And whilst many incels post violent content without intention to act, there have been multiple instances when they have acted on the things that they claim to want to do. The victim ideology and red pill theory present in incel forums overlaps with the victimization and red pill theory popular in the alt-right and white supremacist groups. In such a way, academics have hypothesized that it is highly probable that incels have been a radicalizing factor in cases where it has not been recognized, and they propose that a review of mass killings over the last decade to look for incel sympathies could easily yield more attributable deaths. But incels only hate women, so why would they be seen as a security threat when they only threaten some of the population? Incels differ from typical misogynists because they threaten violence against men and women. They believe that society as a whole has been corrupted by women's sexual freedom. 
The clearest articulation of incel as ideological extremism came from the 141-page manifesto released by Elliot Roger hours before his mass killing spree in 2014. Roger describes a desire to utilize terror and violence to overthrow the existing social hierarchy. Every single time I've seen a guy walk around with his beautiful girlfriend, I've always wanted to kill them both in the most painful way possible. They deserve it. They must be punished. The males deserve to be punished for living a better and more pleasurable life than me. And the females deserve to be punished for giving that pleasurable life to those males instead of me. On the day of retribution, I will finally be able to punish them all. Does it make sense now that the removal of these threads were associated with the Joaquin Phoenix Joker film? But it's all well and good raising awareness as this video has attempted to do, but what can we actually do? So what can we do? On a personal level, sadly, not much short of being educated and empathetic towards men who are at risk of falling into the rabbit hole of online misogyny. However, on a government and a community scale, there may be some hope. Misogynistic violence, including the misogyny shown in incel culture, is mostly seen and depicted as a private issue. Furthermore, it's rare that it would be regarded as a public threat, despite the evidence that incel is a form of violent extremism in some cases. Many hypothesize that securitizing incel may be a step towards addressing misogynistic violence as a threat overall, while simultaneously cracking down on the violent extremism present in some wings of inceldom. Securitization refers to the act carried out by a speaker in a position of authority. The speaker labels something as a security threat to a referent object. When this statement is accepted by an audience, securitization has occurred. However, it has been regarded as problematic emergency politics that should be unnecessary in a healthy democratic system. And for traditionalists, securitization involves the use of force. But those that argue for securitizing incel don't advocate for these traditional uses of exceptional force, but nevertheless consider the speech act of securitization necessary to drive a meaningful state action. The presence of the community online being subject to jokes and memes Means, and the undermining of the effect of online abuse takes away from the seriousness that incel communities exist in. Without the elevation of incel as a security threat, some propose that there is a risk that democratic governments, civil societies, and public commentators will fall back on conservative cultural attitudes applied to other misogynistic crimes. An example of this attitude applied to misogynistic crimes is the death of Eurydice Dixon in 2018. Dixon was stalked, raped, and murdered walking home in Melbourne. A police superintendent advised women to have situational awareness, carry their phones, and call the police if they were concerned. In making these proclamations, opinion leaders and people in power categorise these attacks as a private concern to do with one's behaviour as opposed to a public threat. This is part of culture where officials and members of society shift the blame off of those who are violent and onto the victim's lack of avoidance of said violence. People are instead tasked with being aware of how to avoid when instead there should be a lot more focus on deterring people from raping others. Of course, pragmatically, it is a good thing to be aware of how to avoid violence and how to defend yourself, but the overarching blame on women for this is something that runs very deep in society. In fact, not even women are the only ones blamed. Men that are victims of sexual assault also get victim blamed too. The Australian Parliament then tried to pass a legislation to relax bans on important weapons so that individuals, <coughs> women, could better defend themselves. Basically, if she had a gun, 
she wouldn't have been linked. When Senator Sarah Hansen Young suggested that this wasn't effective policy making, as it made women and not society responsible for preventing gendered violence, Senator David Lionham responded that she should stop shagging men in an issue of vicious personal attacks on her character. This example demonstrates how a public threat, or gendered violence, is rendered a private issue. It's not gendered, it's your own responsibility, and undermined by attacks and a metonomic fallacy that suggests that since the actions of the whole are fine, we don't need to worry about the extremism of the few. This was unnecessary hostility towards a justified criticism. And it echoes the not all men attitude that we frequently see when we talk about gendered violence statistics. In this criticism, Young isn't blaming men. Young is saying putting all the responsibility on women is not effective. It is Lionham that makes this an issue about sex and men, not Young, in an attempt to defend men with the not all men rhetoric. The result was that Parliament effectively did nothing hamstrung by public divisiveness and political inertia, which undermined the ability to address the actual public threat. Although the fact that women have always faced the security threat of indiscriminate violence from perpetrators inspired by misogyny should be enough in its own right to encourage effective action, it is not. But by expanding the threat of misogynistic violence to the remainder of the population, as incel extremists do, we are provided with opportunities to reshape public discourse around gendered violence and misogyny, of which underlies the ideology used to inspire incel violence. Not only does incel violence constitute a threat to the entire public because of their tendencies to target both women and men, gendered violence also poses a threat to everyone, as evidence suggests that support for violence against women is a key indicator of support for violence extremism in general. Numerous researchers have pointed out that most male mass murderers in Western countries in recent years have a history of violence against women. Therefore, misogynistic violence can be argued to present exactly the sort of public threat that requires exceptional political intervention, such as labelling incel and the ideology as a security threat. While incels purport to seek vengeance on Chads and Stacys, it is clear that they see their fellow citizens and the states in which they live as the enemy. Generating an issue culture that interprets incel as a security threat has been argued to lift gendered violence out of the realm of gender politics and into that of security. However, one of the most concerning problems is the creation of a suspect community. Patnassis and Pemberton define a suspect community as a subgroup of the population that is singled out for state attention as being problematic. Specifically in terms of policing, individuals individuals may be targeted, not necessarily as a result of suspect wrongdoing, but possibly because of their presumed membership to the subgroup. At the root of this problem is the assumption that possible violent extremism is an attribute of another category, such as a membership of a suspect community, which contains many individuals who will never be violent. Traditional policy responses have assumed that extremism emerges from different religious, ethnic and cultural backgrounds, and people belonging to these categories are rendered as suspect communities. Ironically though, the end result of securitizing the religion, ethnicity, or culture has heightened social alienation and radicalization. Thus, the crude securitization of a group such as the Manosphere could aggravate members' feelings of persecution and alienation, feeding into the not all men policy derailments and radicalizing more members. In order to prevent further ostracization that many men who are part of the Manosphere experience, whether that be something we are sympathetic with or not, there needs an effort to be made to understand the foundations of this extremism and attempt to diminish them without creating a sense of persecution or victimhood among men or the manosphere. 
However, this relies on changing the public discourse around gendered violence. This is why it must be seen as a societal issue rather than a private or an isolated one, as it is a range of societal factors that nurture and excuses the behaviour and misogynistic ideology. It is important to remember that incels, like other members of the manosphere and the far right, feel disaffected, disillusioned, disheartened, entitled titled and victimised, embattled and enraged. And though we may not feel like they are owed it, a method of empathy may be more beneficial to avoid further isolating them. If we address misogynistic violence and behaviour as a community problem that has negative effects on everyone, we avoid stigmatising particular groups and communities. As Silk points out, whilst terrorist activities are not normal, they are normal people. The avoidance of thinking of these people as estranged outgroups and preventing the establishment of an us versus them dichotomy can make the primary effort to tackle this problem a lot less hostile and hopefully more successful. For example, by developing shared norms that condemn misogynistic attitudes, these new norms make it more difficult for groups such as incels to thrive in the first place. However, this can't be a matter of censorship or silencing these ideologies. Although people inciting violence should be dealt with by various companies or law enforcement as per their legislation, the policing of public debate around gendered violence can push these people further ajar. Instead, a collective and deliberative condemnation of those who support violent extremists and moreover creating an issue culture around gendered violence can reduce the possibility that people who dismiss the seriousness of such crimes maintain influence. Research also suggests that involving women in policy, community leadership and politics mitigates the threat of violent extremism in general. Women being underrepresented in politics, security organisations and public commentary contributes to the lack of strong social norms around discussing gendered violence, as well as the inability of the democratic system to act upon this. Governments need to address the gender imbalance in Parliament and consider the ways in which the formation and composition of the public sphere further marginalises women's perspectives. After all, how can we discuss problems and strategies without the people that are most affected. On a community level, further education of community workers, police, politicians and teachers to engage with misogyny's threat to public security would simultaneously solve some of the pitfalls of contemporary responses to gender-based violence more broadly. For example, such workers would be educated about the dangers of victim blaming, which normalise the perspective that such violence has a sense to it, rather than attributing all blame to the perpetrators of said violence. And in this, it is also important to involve those who are likely to be victims of radicalisation, young men. Research shows that success in instilling new norms is often determined by our identification with the messenger, so programmes could explicitly use opinion leaders, including those capable of commanding respect from the manosphere, as agents of behavioural change. And this is why other political movements also heavily rely on allyship to raise the issues into the mainstream sphere. Of course, this shouldn't be necessary, but it is, and if we want change, we need to be pragmatic. There must be careful consideration of the perceived injustices that drive incel attacks, an approach advocated for by the UN Plan of Action to Prevent Violent Extremism. For incels, the perceived injustices relate to the lack of sexual and social opportunity. Whilst entitlement and misogyny underpins this perception, things that we may struggle to empathise with, recognising this helps us understand how individuals' radicalisation stems from alienation, rather than simply their categorisation as male or MRA. Again, this avoids putting the blame on being a man or advocating for men's rights which reduces the alienation already experienced by these people. As Kimmel argues, individuals want to feel that they belong, that they matter, and this needs to be possible from within the system, not in opposition to it. 
Moreover, a primary program to combat the rise of violent extremism ought to include seeking to tackle social isolation for all individuals. However, when it comes to changing individual behaviour, the secondary level of intervention at the point of individual radicalisation is understood to be the most effective. This involves identifying individuals and intervening with support programs to reorientate their behaviour and expectations. However, successful secondary programs require careful identification of individuals to alleviate the risk of creating a suspect community. Knight, Woodward and Lancaster list indicators as including exposure to extreme violence, being a victim of bullying, a deliberate disconnection from others, low self-esteem, underachievement, feeling a personal responsibility to act, functioning in a low security environment, and traveling for or engaging in extremist training and events. In addition, Becker lists being a young male, having a criminal record that includes violence, an identified psychological disorder, a developed set of radical beliefs, gang membership, being Islamist or in the far right, and marginally being a student or being part of an extremist group. Social psychology research indicates further signifiers of risk, such as high levels of social isolation, lack of positive relationships with women, and peer interactions that condone or reinforce Force misogynistic attitudes. Again, having these indicators does not determine violent extremism, but their coexistence indicates increased risk of radicalization. Once those at risk of radicalization are identified, Kimmel advocates projects such as Exit Sweden, Exit Deutschland, Life After Hate, and the Quilliam Foundation. They include support such as safe houses, job training, tuition, job placement, judgment free counseling drug or alcohol abuse programs, leisure activities, youth clubs, and sport clubs. Crucially, these programs are run by former members of such groups, allowing the experience to be a truly empathetic and authentic one. Now, I know what people are probably thinking, how are we going to pay for that? Probably the taxpayer, right? Why would we want to help criminals and horrible people reform so that they can contribute to society? so that they can lessen the risk the violence will fester. These people shouldn't be violent, these people shouldn't be extremists, they shouldn't believe what they believe, but they do. And the only thing that we can do is combat that. Rehabilitation is one of the biggest things that the left seem to argue over, and I'm sorry, but if we want to make things better, we need to help people that do wrong. But more importantly, we need to help people who are at risk of doing wrong before they do so. Third stage responses are those that are most associated with securitization, and they enact a break from conventional tools used to govern populations and implement levels of surveillance, monitoring, or control that might be politically unpalatable. These organizations could use existing surveillance laws and operational guidelines to effectively police misogynistic violence. They can monitor individuals who are engaging in suspect behavior and or have a high risk profile based upon peer group membership and social psychological indicators. So it's well within the immediate realm of action to use the existing power of the state to respond to an already defined suspect who seems likely to commit an act of violent extremism. However, prevention of radicalization is more cost effective and risk averse than attempting to stop violent extremism at its site. As well as this, as the stages progress, the risk of invasion of privacy becomes more apparent. This should be a last case scenario, there to prevent an actual attack of violence where it is expected. As with a lot of issues that affect society, the solutions usually include re-education, raising awareness, rehabilitation, and increased empathy and understanding around why people pose a danger to others. So be aware, 
Next time the word incel gets thrown around as a funny joke, or your favourite influencers start laughing about condoning incel ideology, don't underestimate the issues that actually surround the incel community. Thank you for watching this very long video on incels. I hope you enjoyed it, and if you didn't because of the subject matter, I hope it educated you on the issues within the community. Ending on a positive note then, if you've made it this far, thank you. Please subscribe if you enjoyed this video. More videos like this will be coming as well as shorter videos because this was very, 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 very intense. And with that, I hope to see you soon.